This interview is a part of the Oklahoma Historical Society's Oral History Program, Living Legends Collection. This interview was originally done in May of 1971. We have no specific day given in the introduction. This interview is conducted by Mr. Pendleton Woods. The interviewee is Mr. Jack Brown of Tahlequah, Oklahoma. This interview is being re-recorded on July the 24th, 1985, for inclusion in the permanent collections of the Oral History Program by Judith Michener. This is Ken Woods interviewing for the Oklahoma Living Legends, and uh, we are in Tahlequah at North Northeastern State College, and I am visiting with Mr. Jack Brown, who is the Executive Vice President of the Cherokee Seminaries Association. We are uh, here on the day of the Cherokee Seminary's uh, annual reunion. Uh, Mr. Brown, to start with, I wonder if you would tell us uh, where you were born and who your parents were. I was born at Marble City, Oklahoma, which was then 10 miles north of Salisaw Indian Territory. My father was John Lafayette Brown. My mother was Sally Virginia Mackey Brown. Did you say, uh, did uh, uh, your son-in-law say that you were, your father was a United States Marshal? My father was a United States Marshal, an Indian policeman, at the time of his retirement, he was chief of the United States Police Force in the Muskogee Office, Muskogee, Oklahoma, which is now Muskogee Area Office, Bureau of Indian Affairs. To, uh, uh, to try to reminisce a little, I think we might start with any personal experiences that you may know about your father from what, he, from what you know uh, or from what he may have told you, some of the experiences he may have had as a law officer in this part in the Indian Territory. I was born May the 3rd, 1847, at Marble City, Indian Territory. Father's home was a type that was known as a dog trot house. It consisted of two large log rooms with a breezeway between these rooms. The building was constructed by a ship carpenter from the state of Maine. He and some of his workers were experts in their line of work. The timbers in the building were at least eight inches in diameter and up to 14 inches in diameter or more. At that time, the immediate neighborhood was covered with luxuriant vegetation and fine trees, including many valuable walnut trees. The beams in the ceilings of the building were solid walnut, hewn down to about a six to 14 inches across and above and reaching from one wall to the other. The logs composing the building were hewn to six inches from diameter trees mentioned above. The corners of these logs were put together by a broad axe as they were sides were hewn also with the broad axe. The corner notches were very exact. A storm could not have blown the building away 
because of this construction. All rafters were made of sycamore saplings. The saplings were fastened together at the bottom and top by wooden pegs. The floors were rough lumber, planed with a hand plane. The outside porch floors were ash and when scrubbed with the corn shuck broom and lye made from a lye hopper in the yard, the floors were very bright. The inside floors were plain pine lumber, planed with the plane and uh, very protective for draft from coming from the floor. The uh, contractor must have executed the work or had workmen with him that were skilled with uh, stone tools. The fireplace in the family room was constructed of marble mined in the neighborhood adjoining our farms. The farm, the fireplace in the living room was faced entirely by this marble and the keystone had engraved on it the Masonic emblem of a blue rod, the third degree. The other room spoken of was on the west side of the building. It was used by father as sheriff of Illinois district in the keeping his prisoners who were all of Cherokee descent until he had accumulated a wagon load of prisoners. When they were brought from Marble City to Tahlequah, Oklahoma and turned over to the uh, high chief who had charge of the old building that, that is now used as Cherokee County Jail. It was necessary to keep uh, these prisoners comfortable and safe for delivery to Tahlequah. To do so, they were always provided with a fireplace, plenty of fuel which father and his guards had them fashioned for the fireplace. I can remember very distinctly patterning after some of the prisoners when they were greasing their boots with tallow. I did mine that had a red top and brass toes the same way but kept my boots a little bit too long under the forelog. The prisoners had to throw me down after I screamed and jerked my boots off. The old building has not been preserved in picture form. It is now replaced by some of the modern structures of the day. On the old home place is located two large brooder houses that will contain 3,000 young chickens or laying hens at one time. My father was 
an officer connected with peace duties as long as I can remember him. And when it was necessary, he always had his side arms in handy placement. There was one thing that I noticed, and lots of people ask why he could do such. For amusement, he would sometime take his prisoners and one or two guards down by the wood pile, put a target up on a tree, and permit the prisoners to shoot at that target. They had their instruction. They did not dare use their arms for anything but target practice because there was safety behind them. On one of Father's trips, when he uh, loaded the wa covered wagon and put uh, a trusted prisoner in charge with a guard in front, father and another guard behind, they set out for Tahlequah, Oklahoma. When he had delivered his prisoners, it is necessary, of course, to contact the High Sheriff's Office to collect his expenses for arresting and boarding the prisoners. It took a little bit of time to do that, and a great many times he returned the wagon with one of the guards back home, and he came back a day or so later. On one trip, it was necessary when he was returning home to stop with the full blood family with whom he was very closely acquainted. He accepted an invitation for lunch. After the lunch was finished and visiting was not over, His benefactor asked him if uh, he liked the meat dish. Father's reply was, it was a very good squirrel. No squirrel, John. Polecat. My father never talked to me very much. I've always been regretting why he did not loosen up on his conversation so that we might have more information of this kind, but there was one statement that might be interesting. Father was a deputy United States Marshal in the jurisdiction of Judge Parker, the hanging judge of Fort Smith, Arkansas. At the time, the United States government took over some of the criminal affairs, and my understanding was it covered instances where a white man and an Indian were concerned many times in criminal offenses. Judge Parker told his uh, United States Marshal, who was resident and headquarters at Fort Smith, Arkansas, that now that we are operating under this late statue of the United States government, it will be necessary that we have an individual who is part of Full Blood Cherokee and who is 
acquainted with Cherokee Indian ways can be trusted and depended upon to execute certain papers that might be delivered to him. Marshall's reply was that I know of a man that will be very fitting for the requirements that you have. What is his name? His name is John L. Brown, 10 miles north of Salisaw, Oklahoma. The first opportunity that you have and you are in that vicinity, contact Mr. Brown and bring him to the office. Father made the trip to Fort Smith, and as he and the marshal were entering the door, court was in session on a murder trial. The judge called to the United States Marshal by first name and said, Court is adjourned for a period of 10 minutes. Whom do you have with you? I have John Brown, the individual I promised to bring to your court. Stand up, John Brown, and be sworn in as Deputy United States Marshal from your vicinity. My father said he never was so frightened in all of his life. He said, making an arrest of any kind never concerned me in that way. Can you think of any other instances dealing with Judge Parker that uh, your father told you about? I went to school to a Cherokee tribal school in Braggs, Oklahoma. While there, I heard uh, a few details of a murder that was committed in a mercantile store at Braggs. My father had been trying to collect a debt that uh, uh, citizen owed him and always excused himself with the information that he didn't have the money now but would pay later. Father then said, how about a scheme of this kind? I have a son about eight years old and since his mother has passed away, I wonder if you and your family could take care of him and let him attend the school at Braggs, Oklahoma. While there, I met a merchant by the name of Madden. I believe he was a non-citizen, probably married to a Cherokee. There was about a three-quartered Cherokee Indian whose name was Mose Miller. Mose's wife and Mose uh, shopped at Mr. Madden's store. Their charges had run for quite a period, so Mr. Madden knew that a man in the store was Mose Miller's dependable friend who drank with him, went to dances, 
and uh, otherwise for a company at a great many events in the nation. Mr. Madden asked Mose, ask Moses' friend if he wouldn't tell Mose to come in and take care of his debt, which had been running quite a while. This man probably thought he would have some fun with Mose. He said, uh, Madden said, if you didn't come in and pay this debt, he's going to shoot you. At the time he told Mose that, he was drinking himself. Mose said, I'm going in and I'll beat him to it. He did, as he stated, while Mr. Madden was waiting on a customer, an Indian woman, he was brutally shot down without any explanation. Judge, Park, Judge Parker immediately had a warrant completed for Moses' arrest. Father took all the precaution that he did, even as stated in his uh, allowing the prisoners to shoot at targets. He told the man that was working with him near Bragg's Indian Territory, I'll have a quart of liquor from Fort Smith on the express passenger train. You take this part, this liquor, after arranging for a dance on Bragg's Mountain. The Bragg's Mountain owner of a log cabin, one-room log cabin, agreed to finish everything for a dance. The one run log cabin was vacated of furniture consisting of beds and chairs with one table reserved and chairs for two chairs probably for the musicians who were called fiddlers at the time. Mose was especially invited to attend the dance, even though he did not enjoy dancing. The liquor was placed on the table. Mozart sat down. After a few drinks, he wondered why the young people standing around the walls of the room were not dancing. He said, I came here to see you folks dance. Now get to work. If you don't, I'm going to start shooting. As promised, he shot several times in the floor. Not close to them, but it wasn't very long until the dance proceeded Mose lost interest in the dance, but soon had the most of the quart bottle of liquor consumed. Father's assistant came to him where he was waiting outside in concealment with the information, John, the man is ready. Father went in while Mose had fallen over on the table to have drunk. Loaded him in the buggy, took him to Bragg's. The next day, they started for j the jail at Fort Smith. <clears throat> on the trip, Mose said, John, I'm going to get out of this. And when I do, I'm going to come home. I'm going to kill you. 
Father said, Mose, after you have met Judge Parker and been a resident of his jail for a period of time, I believe you'll change your mind About the time that Mose had served his sentence, my father advised the older sister, who was his housekeeper at that time, that Mose was to be released from Judge Parker's jail on the coming Sunday. He said, when I took him down there, that he was going to come and shoot me. He said, Father's question to Brownie was, do you feel afraid? Well, I'm not, if you're not concerned. Mose came about Monday or Tuesday stayed with my father a period of full two weeks. They had one of the most, most congenial meetings and reminisces of, that any two Indians might have had. To his own detriment, after promising the court and Judge Parker that he would not drink anymore, he fell into the company of others who were drinking. He got into a fuss with a man and shot the man. Of course, there was another writ issued. Father's deputy said, John, uh, I'll apprehend Moles sometime. This man lived in Vian, Oklahoma, close to our cattle ranch. He went out one day looking for Mose, and the two of them met on the crossing by Ann Creek. I don't believe that Mose ever saw John Brockman, but John Brockman ended Mose's life there for the reward that was outstanding at that time. Do you think of any other criminals that, uh, uh, particularly named criminals, that uh, your father might have been in contact with at some time? Our home was three miles from Dwight Mission. Dwight Mission at that time was a missionary school operated by the Preveton Mission Board from New York City. About 1896, father got instructions from uh, the United States Marshal's Office at Muskogee, Oklahoma, that uh, Superintendent Peterson of Dwight Mission had requested a peace officer to appear at graduation services at Dwight Mission and uh, see that there was 
little or no drinking or drunkenness during the graduating exercises. Father knew that a certain man related to the family on my mother's side was receiving a buggy load of whiskey from Fort Smith and it would be delivered to him at Zion, Oklahoma. Father then went with a first cousin of mine in a buggy to apprehend this man before he appeared with his load of liquor at Dwight. The man saw his father and his buggy and recognized him first, jumped out of the buggy and began shooting. My cousin said there was nothing for him to do but to jump out and run from the buggy. Father stepped out and uh, with a flash of his My cousin said there was nothing for him to do but to jump out and run from the buggy. Father stepped out and uh, with a flash of his pistol had succeeded in stopping the man. He took possession of the liquor. There was none, there was no disturbance at Dwight Mission at the time. I happened to be living with a lant at Mesquite Switch and attending Cherokee Public School at that place. I was very concerned about what Judge Parker would do with my father for shooting a man. Of course, he had to be tried but the case resulted in justification. And as all deputy United States Marshals who had to arrest men in that manner, he was acquitted and freed, which was very interesting to we children. There was one other instance that I might mention. Father lost what we called his pistol finger. That would be the finger next to the index. He was trying to apprehend a bootlegger at that time who happened to be a Cherokee. This man concealed himself behind a tree and uh, father took the convenience of a nearby tree. They both began to shoot at one another. The man succeeded in shooting father's pistol from his hand, causing the loss of that finger. Father, without any regard to safety, reached down, picked up the pistol, called the man by his name, said, I'm coming after you. The man walked out behind the tree, both hands up, pistol on the ground. There's another instance of that nature, and I think it's about all that I could mention.
There was a Turkey court in in uh, session in what was known, as far as I can determine, as Flint District. A Cherokee was being tried by the Cherokee court and some of his friends who were more guilty probably than he was in the offense for which he was being tried, which I do not recall now. Anyway, several men marched into the court with guns placed and a fight, with guns placed in sight, and a fight ensued. My father, my father was injured by one shot. His hat was knocked off and he obtained another scar in the top of his head, resulting in the loss of a very few hairs. Uh, some of I'm, that, I'm can that tape be run back? No, we didn't. There's not enough to fool with on that. Uh, I'm Mrs. Roberts, and Mrs. Roberts. Uh, I was here right. while, he is, while he is busy. Um, um, I don't know what you've covered, but uh, go right ahead with your, with your stories and your memories of these times, and I'll, I'll find questions along. My older brother, 10 years older than I, graduated from Cherokee Male Seminary in 1896. Father sent him to a business college in Fort Smith, Arkansas. While he was studying in this business college, he took occasion to visit Judge Parker's court in Muskogee, his jail, and for a reason became very interested in that. Father being one of the deputy United States Marshals, Red Cloud concluded that he might obtain a job as guard at the jail. My father said that's an arrangement that you'll never be able to consummate. I've got a job for you. You're going to the old home and take care of the few cattle that we have around there. In the course of time, it became necessary to take a carload of steers to Kansas City Market. Red Cloud had a habit of 
consuming at the bottle. When he came home, the information was that he was fairly well intoxicated. <laughs> he went to the home after crossing the creek, which at that time was very deep and shallow, probably by flooring. Red Cloud arrived at the home, and evidently there was nobody there, and probably continued to entertain the bottle. Sometime in the morning, a man that was uh, working with him, a three-quarter blood Cherokee Indian, whom my aunt had uh, raised, returned uh, about four o'clock from a dance that he had attended. He advised my aunt that morning that when he got home, Red Cloud was found on the bed, dead, his face completely blotted out by a blast of a shotgun. Evidence indicated that the murder was completed on the front porch. A pool of blood was there and uh, was also led to the bed where the shotgun was placed as if it was a suicide occurrence. There was evidence around the building that an individual with what is terminally known as a wooden leg had trapped or through the blood and carried that into several rooms of the building. A man of Indian extraction with a cork leg and a nail in the bottom of the cork leg horizontally placed where it would make tracks was uh, decided the murderer. This Indian was taken to Muskogee, Oklahoma and convicted in the courts at that place at that time. The sentence was very mild because of the lack of good evidence. I shall always think that somebody else was guilty of this offense, who was very close acquainted with Red Cloud, and that there was no cause for robbery because it never turned out that any bunny was visiting. When the carload of cattle was paid for, a draft was sent to my father at Vian, Oklahoma, which were his headquarters at, the at that time. My father 
John Lafayette Brown was also an Indian policeman at the near end of the dissolution of the Cherokee Nation and after the death of the chief of police, father became the chief of Indian police and was headquartered at Muskogee where he lived until his death. He had uh, experience as an Indian police and a United States Marshal from Muskogee, Oklahoma to Coffeyville, Kansas, which is the nearest station for leaving the train near the border of Oklahoma. His duties were then under the United States Marshal at Muskogee, Oklahoma to control as best as possible the introduction of whiskey into the Cherokee Nation. I have seen instances when I was about eight or nine years old that liquor was loaded onto the tender of the locomotive on the cow catcher or some other places because there was a United States law forbidding the transportation of the liquor by express. I imagine my father has uh, turned over to the marshal's office many quarts of liquor in his duties of that nature. Going to another picture. Okay. Oh, this. Let me get this in. All right. Go ahead. Father, as I stated, was <coughs> a sheriff under the jurisdiction of the Cherokee Nation. The Cherokees. Uh, had a system of elections that's not quite as modern as they are today. Father acknowledged that he was guilty of uh, taking advantage of the opposite party when he would tell a friend of his that he wanted him to take some liquor to a certain voting precinct and uh, dispense it to the opposite side. This was done so that uh, when the recipient of the alcohol went to vote, usually he could not was not able to write the name of person for whom he wanted to vote. That, I understand, was carried out quite a few instances in the nation. And probably no one suffered because he was not caught at it, probably. The question you're asking? Oh, well, I was pointing to the Cherokee, sem to the uh, Mint Seminary. Now, did you attend the Mint Seminary? About 18 and 95, my, when my mother was deceased, 
I was living with an aunt across Illinois River, right near what is the Kerr-McGee manufacturing location of some modern fuel for generation of electricity. Father felt that it was necessary for me to get started in uh, grade school. Dr. Peterson, who was superintendent of Dwight Mission, was transferred to the Presbyterian Mission at Tahlequah. During his term at Tahlequah, Presbyterian Mission, he uh, obtained sabbatical leave and attended uh, a medical college in the state of Michigan and was a fra practicing physician at uh, Telefocus for, for quite some time. I came by a covered wagon over the hills from near what is now Gore, Oklahoma. On the trip, I remember very distinctly having to go down a very steep hill. The driver of the covered wagon had brought along an ax with him purposely to assist his brakes in getting down this hill. He got out and cut a substantial pole and blocked both wheels and drugged them, dragged them down the hill. That evening, we succeeded in arriving at the Cherokee Insane Asylum, <clears throat> located about five miles southwest of Tahlequah, Oklahoma. We camped there under the trees, and at the time, I was void of the fact that sometime I might become superintendent of an institution that would replace the insane asylum. The Cherokee Orphan Asylum, which is located at Salina, Oklahoma, was burned about 1903. The students from that school were moved immediately to the Cherokee Male and Female Seminary and to the Cherokee Insane Asylum after it was vacated by their inhabitants. Those people were moved to the old jail in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. The uh, first six grades were moved to the Insane Asylum a building, which became the uh, Cherokee Orphan Asylum, later known as the Cherokee Training School. Because of its semblance to an institution for young criminals, Cherokee uh, officials succeeded in having the name changed to Cherokee Vocan Vocational School. The name was later changed to Cherokee Orphan, uh, Cherokee Orphan 
school due to the fact that the supervisor of Indian Education headquarters in Washington, D.C., who visited the institution very often, decided it would be nice if he could have some Eastern Cherokees from North Carolina transferred to the Cherokee Orphan Asylum so that they might have advantage of a craft that we had established at the school. The school had been very successful after locating a guard in the Washington Monument and uh, probably working in some other part of the park system of Washington who had experience in weaving. His weaving was in shops in New York City that were in the power dri driven looms. He, with the assistance of a shopman, succeeded in uh, making looms that uh, some are being used now by the Church Key Arts and Crafts office that is located on the Cherokee complex south of Tahlequah. After my enrollment at uh, the Presbyterian Mission, I completed the third grade living with an uncle by the name of Tuxy Brown, who at one time was secretary of the Cherokee National Board of Education. <coughs> I attended next a Cherokee public school at Bragg's, Oklahoma. The occasion was instituted by the fact that my father had been unsuccessful for some time in collecting a debt from a friend of his. Father asked him if it would be all right to send me to his home in Bragg's with an opportunity of attending a Cherokee public school there that would cancel the debt. I attended this school in Bragg's about 18 and 96 and 97. There I saw my first circus on one of his trips from Fort Smith to Copperville, Kansas. Father stopped to see how I was getting along in school. I succeeded in talking him out of approximately one dollar and seventy-five cents to ascend this circus. Before the circus was due to arrive, a neighborhood man appeared at Mr. Walker's place with a catfish that uh, I cannot estimate the measurement, but to my recollection, he must have been 18 inches long, entirely adequate for 
a meal for the whole family. I spent my $1.75 for the catfish. I was hoorawed a number of times by the family and especially by my bed bedmate who was a young Indian who was farm labor for Mr. Walker. After they had gotten me into a situation of shedding tears, they assured me that I need not be concerned anymore that I would see the circus. Tell about the circus at that time. Beg pardon? Tell us about what the circus was like at that time. The circus was, as I recall, a two-ring circus. They had uh, trapeze, they had elephants, and some caged animals. The thing that impressed me, though, more than anything else, was that they took one of the tub-like stools that the elephants used to stand on, and a clown in a very cardy costume stood on this tub-like concern and rendered a song that became very popular at that time. There'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. Everybody in the public school that attended the circus was soon singing, there'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. You may be interesting to know that the public school did not always have their own tribal building in which to teach. If it was convenient, some of the local churches were loaned to the Cherokee Board of Education. This school that I attended was in one of those tight buildings. I can say that one of the hardest lickings I ever got in my life, and not bragging, I probably did not get as many as I deserved. Two of us were sitting in a combination seat that accommodated two. A boy behind me reached over and pulled my hair, which was can say that one of the hardest lickings I ever got in my life, and not bragging, I probably did not get as many as I deserved. Two of us were sitting in a combination seat that accommodated two. A boy behind me reached over and pulled my hair, which was probably very long at that time, because it's quite a time between barbershop calls, which was provided by father when he could visit us, I screamed like everything, because it was painful. The teacher was busy at his desk and didn't see the action, but heard it. He said, who was that that hollered? At that time, I said, it was me. Probably I should have said it was I. Why did you holler so loud? Forgetting the name of the boy 
now, I said, calling his name, and he pulled my hair, and I had to holler. You boys come up here on the stage. We did, without any questions. We, get, we received a real hard punishment. Probably it had its effect, and I'm wondering at this time if the old Hickory Switch should not be put back into service, not so severely as I got, but enough to remind the one that there were rules and regulations that should be as uh, observed that was at that time without any protest. Now, where were you in that time? Bragg's, Bragg's. Indian Territory. My next public school, Turkey Public School experience was at Weber's Falls. We had living there an aunt who was on the Trail of Tears from east of the Mississippi River and father ask her if she wouldn't take care of me so I could go to public school there and later on an older sister, a younger sister. This aunt had an experience that was related to us and related in a, what you might conclude is a revengeful manner. She was probably justified if you are acquainted with uh, Cherokee history and uh, treatment by some of their neighbors east of the Mississippi River. It was one evening about uh, dusk time that the group was halted and told that we would take time for overnight camp and you can begin preparing your supper. My aunt was stooping over, attending to the campfire, when she said she happened to glance up, pardon me, and she saw a long knife going through the air. She heard the scream of a soldier who she noticed and others noticed had been overloading a teenage Indian boy and even prodding him with bayoneted rifles. She said that in less than 30 minutes, she heard two shots quite a distance out in the woods. The soldiers returned. Everything was forgotten by them for the next day's journey. My aunt could never forget that incident. I, in all probability, if she was not a close friend of this boy. She knew his, his situation and what his imposition was. I can remember that very distinctly her feeling for any white man. 
our closest neighbor on the west side was a doctor by the name of Burke. He was married to a Cherokee woman. My aunt had no use for Dr. Burke, whatever. There was never a better neighbor than his wife, and one in whom she could put any kind of trust. I don't believe that feeling ever felt left my Aunt Charlotte Fields. Did she tell you any of the uh, instances or experiences on the trail of tears? Only that one, except she did declare that it is mighty cold, that it is wet, and that the morning the soldiers came to her, they were in a group that did not volunteer to come to the new Indian territory. She said it was Monday morning. They were washing, using what were commonly termed wash pots. She said their laundry was some finished some were in the wash pot boiling. Some was on the line drying, but they were not allowed to procure their laundry. They were lined up and herded to the place of confinement until the entire group was ready to start on the march. That, too, was an experience that she did not enjoy. I stayed in her home until 1901. We went to an Indian public school for some reason, there was a, a faction between the Cherokees and uh, a group of whites that had been given authority to attend the school, and the school was split. I recall, not by name, but two of our teachers were from Muscogee Indian Territory at that time. I had to go to school in the Baptist mission instead of the Methodist mission. I was separated from a lot of my Indian friends, but were with a lot of my white friends. Some of my schoolmates had succeeded in obtaining admittance to the Cherokee National Male Seminary at Tahlequah. I was very ambitious to enroll there. Finally, Father consented. He said, now, with the understanding that you stay in school, if you ever run away from that school, I'll whip you all the way back to the school. I never did believe that that was a true threat. He wanted to impress on me how important it was to take advantage of the education that was provided by the tribe. I enrolled in the Cherokee National Mail Seminary in the fall of 1901. I recall that uh, at that time we had a superintendent and 
a principal teacher. Robert Garrett was the superintendent. W. A. Thompson was temporary principal. Later on, the superintendent was abolished during the administration of Superintendent Alberti and a man of wonderful character whom we called, whom we knew as L.M. Logan, became superintendent and principal. L.M. Logan stayed at the seminary for a period of time until he learned that there was a female university being organized in Texas where he had taught. So he enrolled here, was employed as superintendent of this school. He did not stay there too long when he returned to Oklahoma to Indian Territory. Mr. Logan was very interested in the Cherokee boys. He realized that the Cherokee National Government would sometime be dissolved and that the boys of the male seminary must take their place in the government of the country which was so dear to them. He never lost an opportunity to speak them to them in a manner whereby they might establish, if desired, a character, a personal character that would assist them in meeting some of the problems that they were sure to experience. Mr. Logan was at the male seminary, I recall, when the state of Oklahoma purchased the Cherokee National Female Seminary. It would then be necessary to provide for the girls at the female seminary, so they were transferred to the male seminary building. And uh, at 1909 to 10, when the school building burned, we had both boys and girls. Some of the boys blamed the coeducational means as being the cause of the destruction of the old male seminary building. That's how they felt that there should be a school for boys and a school for girls. I succeeded in finishing the course at the Mill Seminary after completing the preparatory school, which then provided a fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. There were no seventh and eighth grade as we generally have in junior and senior high school now. It is quite a step from the sixth grade to the freshman class in high school. I was making suitable progress in the sixth grade previous to Christmas vacation. 
during the vacation time, I returned to my aunt's home in Webber's Falls. It was a very rainy and cold season. I told my father if he would buy me a pair of rubber boots, I'd be glad to assist Aunt Charlotte in doing the milking. I did, and as a result, I contacted a severe case of pneumonia. If it had not been for two brothers from Mississippi who attended me, I would probably not be living at this time. At that time, there were no modern medicines as we have today. Pneumonia was supposed to run its course, and when the crises came, the doctors must have the advantage of spirits. When they told me that I'd have to take a glass of liquor, I said, I won't do it. I've seen too much of it in my family. My father drank too heavily. My brother's death was caused by that, and I'm not going to drink. Dr. Harrison said, Jack, you are good material for a doctor. I admire your feeling, but I want to see you alive. Will you take this medicine to please me? When the pain struck me, I felt like a cross-cut saw was being pulled through my lungs. It didn't take me long to reach for the medicine. I missed three months of school when I returned and uh, finished this sixth grade end of year, it was the decision of my teacher that it would be good if I would take the grade another year. I did. It was very easy to, for me to make good grades. Some I, of the activities on campus when you were there, what were the extracurricular activities? Having students as uh, male entirely, and the greater number of those boys at uh, the time of my enro enrollment would not be called teenagers now. They would be classed as adults and good, strong men. I can recall that our football team averaged as much as 185 pounds. A guard on our team who was so broad that he was called Canoon, which in English is interpreted as frog. This boy played guard and averaged between 220 and 240 pounds. Our football team played uh, during the four years that I was there as a student and uh, very nearly three years as a teacher. Some of the leading 
institutions near our school. We played Rolla School of Mines. We played several high schools in Arkansas. We played a number of colleges in Missouri. And at one time, our team played Arkansas University. We took what we called a team and four substitutes to Arkansas University. The 11 men and four substitutes was our team except a few boys who were called the second team and scrimmaged the first team. The results of that game was a defeat of our school by a score of six to 12. But the boys prided themselves in the fact that the score was very low, that it was a hard game, but none of them were injured. The entire squad of North the, of Arkansas University left the field. Our boys said not because they were giving others to chance to play, but they were injured. One boy was sent to the hospital with a number of broken rims, ribs. Our baseball team was very good too. We had athletic relations with the same schools in baseball. Two of our hardest games were with the Jones Academy, a Choctaw school near McAllister, Oklahoma. These were all Choctaw boys and as heavy and as agile as our boys. We also played Armstrong Academy where I was principal teacher from 1911 to 1912. I had to leave that school because of nervous breakdown. There was no other athletic games at the school except uh, tennis for the teachers. Our boys felt that that was a sissy game and didn't care to play, to participate in it at all. I took my extracurricular activity both as a student and as a teacher by means of tennis. What, uh, hmm. uh, in your early days or in your uh, various uh, experiences, who are some of the personalities that you, uh, of, of Oklahoma history that you have known personally and come in contact with? such as Will Rogers or any of the governors? Or A man whom I admired more than anybody was a graduate of the Cherokee National Female Seminary, Cherokee National Male Seminary. He was also a graduate in the law department of the University of Arkansas the Honorable O.H.P. Brewer was district judge at Muskogee for Cherokee, 
Muskogee and Adair counties for a number of years. When he realized that I was superintendent of the Cherokee Orphan Asylum, I met him in the courthouse at Stillwell, Oklahoma, and in the presence of several lawyers and some citizens of the town, I said, I want to tell you a joke on Jack Brown's institution. He was not there at the time, but he is now superintendent of what used to be the Cherokee Insane Asylum. I, with his father, were members of the Cherokee National Senate. It happened to be my duty as a member of the Board of Inspection to visit various institutions of the Cherokee tribe inspect them and report to the Joint Council, the Senate and the Lower House. When we visited the Cherokee Insane Asylum, they first con conducted us to a part of the building that was not uh, covered with steel windows. We went to a large bedroom where there were no chairs, but there were two inmates visiting and sitting on the beds. One of these men was very large, and the other was a small, lightweight fellow. The large man invited his friend to stand up. He wanted to make a show to the inspectors. He ran his hands in all four pockets of this man turned them wrong side out, turned to them, and said, now don't you feel sorry for him? He has no money and very little sense. Can you think of any other, uh, any other personalities that you have had a close, close acquaintance with? Did you know, uh, did you know Senator Robert Owen? I was not personally acquainted with Senator Robert Owen. I have been in his presence. I have had an introduction to Senator Robert Owen by my father as his son. Robert L. Owens though not uh, so broadly known, was a Virginian. He was related maternally to the Mackey family. Jimmy Mackey, who was a Virginian, sent to Alabama by the colony of Virginia for the purpose of creating friendship with the Cherokee Indians located in Alabama at that time. During his residence there, he married a full-blood Cherokee 
woman. When it came time to make the trip to the Indian Territory, When it came time to make the trip to the Indian Territory, my grandfather brought his family and located in the state of Arkansas. At that time, considered a part of Indian Territory. The family located there because the soil was picturesque of that of the vicinity from which they were excluded. Game was plentiful, the soil was rich. There come a time when the inhabitants of Arkansas considered that, that that was a part of their land, that the Cherokees had not moved far enough. A survey was ordered by the Executive Department of Washington. After the survey was determined, as it now exists, a number of Cherokees had to come farther west. On his way to his new home, grandfather learned by the Fort Smith, Arkansas Gazette, I believe, which is now published. That is other Arkansas Gazette, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah. That uh, there was a salt works 11 miles from the mouth, from uh, the Arkansas River, starting at the mouth of Illinois River. Grandfather purchased and operated this salt work, which is now submerged by Lake Tenkiller. Not knowing all the details of its location, it is my privilege to pass through Cookson, Oklahoma, from uh, Salisaw, Oklahoma, taking, uh, riding a large horse and taking a small pony to W.W. Hastings, then a member of United States Congress at Tahlequah. In going down a steep hill to the side of Illinois River, which had to be crossed later, I asked the student of mine who was carrying the mail at that time from Vianne to Cookson, Oklahoma, those large uh, stand, carved sandstones were there by the side of the road. His reply was that some of the old folks told me that that is a part of the foundation of the Mackey Salt Works. I said, Dick, to my surprise, I'm concluding that that belonged to my grandfather. At home, where I was residing with an aunt, there was in the 
hay, up part of the hay story of that house, a trunk constructed of tin, not ventilated like some of the old time cabinets or safes of the kitchen. This little trunk was loaded with Confederate money still in bundles of certain denominations. My aunt used to point it to us to use a bundle of that to play with in our store in the attic part of the house. The Max Salt Works were located on the United States Military Road from Fort Smith to Texas. A lot of fuel was necessary for the hundred or more cast iron kettles used for evaporating salt, which was piped from the bed of the Illinois River through a la large stone, through a large granite uh, layer of rock where they had succeeded in driving the pipe just down into the rock and forcing the water up onto the, the salt water up onto the bank of the river. Just a little previous to the Civil War, grandfather sold his salt work to a merchant living here in Tahlequah. His family name was Wilson. But during the Civil War, grandfather was too old to be inducted into the Confederate Army, and he knew that there was still a surplus of the salt at the uh, works where he had buildings that were comparable at that time to what we call now our highway hotels to accommodate, to accommodate automobiles. He accommodated covered wagons, hacks, and buggies, and these people stayed all night, lots of times with him, and uh, for a nominal charge, enjoyed lodging and meals. During the war, and after he had uh, moved from the works, he concluded that uh, he could do his part for the North and the South by hauling salt by way of ox wagon to uh, the Northern soldiers, Northern to the Cherokee Northern sympathizers at Fort Scott, Kansas, where he derived in the neighborhood of $29 a bushel for his salt. He also hauled his salt to uh, the South sympathizers near Idabel, Oklahoma, at a place called Fort Towson at that time, which was under the control of the Confederate Army. There he obtained $32 in Confederate money for his salt. What 
what was your principal career after you, was it teaching after you, uh, after those early years? When the Cherokee Male Seminary burned March the 20th, 1910, it is necessary that I find another job. This was the week before Easter that year. I concluded it was advisable that I go over to Muskogee and visit Father during the weekend and probably obtain a suit of clothes and maybe a shirt or two for Easter Sunday. The train arrived back at Tahlequah about 12, 7 o'clock. It was on time. I don't know how the uh, depot agent's wife realized that I would be on the train, but she happened to know that and grabbed me by the hand saying, Jack, if you want to see the remains of the old home, for the last time, you better come to the end of the platform. When we got there, the roof was falling in. The next day, that day, we visited the school as near as we could because of the heat. We returned the next day and several pictures were taken before the columns and the walls were knocked down for safety. About April the 1st, I enrolled in Northeastern State Normal, which is now Northeastern State College. I completed the summer term, there was a vacancy as a teacher in the fifth grade at Stillwell, Oklahoma. I had never had any public school training and not too much teacher training, but a $60 per month job was available. I accepted it. I stayed at a hotel in Stillwell known as the Lee Hotel. I saved the greater part of this $60 as soon as a friend of the family and the Cherokee found that I was going to teach in Stillwell. He said, how would you like to work for me after school? Maybe sometimes kind of late at night. I said, what doing? He said, oh, I am county clerk here. At that time, there was no assessment officer office. The county clerk made the tax rolls. I said, I'd be glad to try it if you tell me what I'm to do. During that time, I worked in his office. The county clerk's office was closed on Saturday. On Saturday, I worked in a gent's clothing store. The funds from these two projects paid my room and board at the hotel, where I enjoyed staying very much and where I enjoyed teaching. At the end of the year, Gay B. Parker, a Choctaw, 
was superintendent of Armstrong Academy, a school for Choctaw males. Here at the end of this tape, I think we'll take a little break and then... Uh... About the uh, time that uh, the period was drawing near for the end of the 1910-1911 school year at Stillwell, Oklahoma, information came to me through some of my instructors at Tulqua that there was a vacancy as principal teacher at Armstrong Academy, a Choctaw boys school for a capacity of about 135 enrollment. The superintendent of the school at that time was Gabe E. Parker, a Choctaw, a graduate of some of the Choctaw tribal schools, and also a graduate of Henry Kendall College, which is now Tulsa, Oklahoma, a uh, Tulsa College. University of Tulsa. Mr. Parker's problem and need at that time was uh, the employment of someone who could uh, take the place of his principal who felt it uh, necessary to enroll at Stillwater Agricultural College, now Oklahoma State University. My need for employment was real, and I appreciated the fact that uh, Probably I could satisfy Mr. Parker on his requirements for supervision of military drill. This might be considered one of the extracurricular activities at the old Cheeky Mail Seminary, destroyed by fire. The salary was $40 more than I was getting at Stillwell, so I immediately accepted. My duties there was principal teacher, instructor of the 7th and 8th grade I was responsible for discipline. In addition, was responsible for military drill, which uh, began at uh, sometimes before breakfast. And if the weather was better, we drilled an hour or so after breakfast. <clears throat> In addition to that, I had supervision of the boys bathing. I conducted chapel exercise. Uh, <clears throat> I supervised the shop and had numerous other duties about the building. I was quartered in the 
main building, which at one time was the capital of the Choctaw Nation, Armstrong Academy was located, as was the Mackey Salt Works, directly on the military road from Fort Smith, Arkansas to the forts in Texas. I learned at one time that uh, Armstrong Academy was quite a settlement, that there were stores adjoining the place, a little post office there, but during the time that I was working there, <coughs> Choco Tribal Affairs had been moved to other locations in the nation so that this place served entirely as a boys' school. Besides the academic work, which also included a, a manual training shop as designated at that time, our shop man, our instructor, was from Muskegon, Michigan. He'd had considerable experience in uh, football and was made uh, coach of the Armstrong Academy team. A.B. Parker was very enthusiastic in athletics. He had experienced every phase of it in Kendall College and in the Choctaw schools. And he thought his boys ought to be versed in that and the military training as had been taught before by experienced soldiers. The man whom I su superseded was a sergeant, had been a sergeant in the United States Army. Mr. Parker really thought that uh, probably I should have come up to his action. There was only one difference in the military training at uh, Armstrong Academy and at the old male seminary where I was captain of Company B. My brother was captain of Company C and a classmate by the name of Martin T. was captain of Company A. At the end of school at Armstrong Academy, it is customary to have a drilling contest. There were judges who simply stood on the grounds and observed the contest, which began with the three companies of the battalion. This contest was conducted at the end of the school, generally at the close of May or the opening of the June month. A student was on a bound when making a mistake in his drill to drop out without the judges call his, his attention to it. And in very few cases, it was never necessary for a judge to point out the man who had made an error. During the time that I was there and before, these contests would last from noon, sometimes until even after the supper time. Supper was delayed because a boy had not made an error in his drilling. This was very exhausting, 
but it is one activity that they took as much interest in as uh, in football or baseball. In football, our boys at Armstrong remembered that they had played the old Cherokee Mail Seminary and Jones Academy at Hartshorn, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, and recalled that the games were very tight games. I had an experience that was unusual at Armstrong. In my enrollment at the Cherokee Mail Seminary, I only took part in class football. I never played foot baseball except uh, as a pastime with a glove and catching. My brother, though, was, younger brother, was an active football player. He was the lightest guy on the team, played tackle next to a guard that weighed 220 pounds. John weighed approximately 135 or 40 pounds. He was exceptionally strong, agile, very quick, and had no fears of contact in football. He did experience one time having his arm broken above the wrist. The school physician, Dr. Jo Charles Ross, who was related to the Brown family, took pride in attending John, who was rather jokeful. He realized what he was doing all the time and kind of wanted to tease the doctor. But the doctor said, now, John, if you don't use that arm, I'm going to put it in the cast. We don't want you to have a stiff arm. Well, one of the most difficult assignments that I had at uh, Armstrong Academy was uh, discipline. All teachers and employees at the academy were responsible in reporting <coughs> breach of conduct to the principal. It was the principal duty at recess time every morning to adjust that discipline report. And it was by the hickory switch, not as it was used, but in a very mild way and lots of times obtained its effect. I only had one experience that by luck avoided injury. One of the boys on the football team that I had played with when uh, Superintendent Parker advised us that Southeastern State Normal at Durant would like for us to come over and scrimmage with their team. They had adequate scrimmage material, but they wanted to play some Indian boys. 
the boys on the team said, well, we don't want to scrimmage them. They're so much heavier than our, we are. They've had more experience than we have. But after Mr. Parker had talked to them a long time, and assured them that they owed it to the normal, he said, well, if the principal and the shop man will play with us on the team, we'll scrimmage them. They issued us uniforms. I succeeded in getting an old pair of shoes on that had been used I don't know how long. I recall that the cleats were very hard on the bottom of my feet. But one experience in that was that for some reason or another, I got rid of corns and bunions. But in the scrimmage in Durant, the first down, I found out that <coughs> my right hand was partially injured and somebody fell on it. Quite a while, I couldn't shake hands with anyone. I was playing right in, and to my surprise, when we landed, lined up, who was facing me but one of the best players on the Cherokee Male Seminary, a young man as fast I was playing right in, and to my surprise, when we landed, lined up, who was facing me but one of the best players on the Cherokee Male Seminary, a young man as fast as he could be and quick. I didn't have much he didn't have much opposition. We did give them a good scrimmage, though. And through that, I became acquainted with several of the professors at Southeastern State College. We later on obtained a coach in the place of our shop man, who was the brother of the coach at uh, Southeastern. This brother said, now next year when you call for scrimmage, we're going to give you some real scrimmage. We're going to see that you profit by it. Well, unfortunately, I was not there to play on the team. I uh, conscientiously entered into my work enthusiastically, but arising at 5.30 in the morning and uh, carrying on the work that was required of me during the day and retiring never later than, never earlier than 11 o'clock and sometimes when it was time to make out reports to be transmitted to Washington, D.C. I never got to bed until 1 and 2 o'clock, which was the result of uh, a nervous breakdown. About October the 12th, 
the matron, a Mrs. Hayes, a very motherly individual, loaded me on to Frisco train at Bokchito, Oklahoma. We arrived in Durant in the late evening in time to catch a sleeper train to Muskogee. I was put into a berth. An ambulance met me at the station, but I was conveyed to home instead of a hospital. I missed about three months of schooling at Armstrong Academy. At Armstrong Academy, uh, the boys had uh, various ways of amusing themselves on weekends and sometime after school. I tried for quite a little while to ascertain where they went when they left the immediate campus. One day, one of the boys felt like he was privileged to take me down to a certain point in the woods. They'd cleaned off quite a little expanse and played Indian ball down there. Indian ball is played with a very small boil and with a hickory stick providing a cup whose bottom was a rawhide thong. There was another object in playing this ball. If there's some old boy that uh, you'd had differences with, it offered an opportunity to peel him over the shin or the head with the ball stick and get by with it as part of the game. Well, we had to stop that. The lighting system was more modern than at the old same male seminary where we had coal oil lamps and some of our spare duty was cleaning lamp chimneys. At Armstrong Academy, they had a gas system. It is necessary to develop gas from a low grade of fuel oil by a pump and lighting a flame until gas was generated. When the gas was turned into the burner and you had a gasoline light, the gas was generated by wood alcohol. I was cautioned to train certain boys for that and to see that they did not consume any of the wood alcohol, thinking that it was a safe intoxicant. After I had uh, left Armstrong Academy, I soon learned that uh, three of the boys died as a result of their taking the wood alcohol to the woods and uh, imbibing of it. Some of the others went blind. Armstrong Academy at one time was, as I said, the seat of the Choctaw government, and the courts were located there. The story goes that uh, when Judge Parker was holding court at Fort Smith, Oklahoma, a warrant was issued for the arrest of a Choctaw who had already been convicted before the Choctaw courts case of murder, was sentenced to die, and the date of his death conflicted with a date that uh, 
Judge Parker's court had issued a warrant for his arrest there. He learned of that and told uh, the man that came from Judge Parker's court to arrest him that he couldn't go to the court at that time, that he was on a bound to appear at Armstrong Academy and to be shot and fall back in his grave for murder. At that time, a grave, grave was prepared. The coffin was in the grave. The man was faced at the foot, shot and fell over into the coffin, was straightened out and covered up. They say that that was an actual offense that actually occurred. I had this story from Gaby Parker, the superintendent, who, after the destruction of Armstrong Academy by fire, was appointed by, through the recommendation of Senator Robert L. Owens, our Cherokee senator, treasurer of the United States Department of Treasury. It is said that K.B. Parker, during World War I, up to that time, signed more government checks than any treasurer official had ever signed. Gaby Parker later became superintendent of Muskogee Five Civilized Tribes Office under the Bureau of Indian Affairs. After I had taught school for about three months in Muskogee County in the public schools, I found out that there was another vacancy in a government boarding school at New York, Oklahoma. My former superintendent of the Old Male Seminary, when it was burned, was accepting the job of superintendent of New York Academy, formerly under the supervision of the Presbyterian Board of New York City. The buildings were constructed by the Creek tribe. The teachers were from the east, and uh, when the uh, Creeks, who were mostly full blood at that time there, learned uh, that they were from New Yorker, they called from New York, they could only say New Yorker and they named their school that. The school, as a Presbyterian mission, was established by the father of Alice Robertson, who was at one time woman congressman from the state of Oklahoma. She was also a postmaster at Muskogee, Oklahoma, I believe. And on a visit to Muskogee with my wife and two children, we were having lunch in the cafeteria. Mrs. Robertson had uh, lost a postmaster job because of change of administration and was operating a cafeteria. We were late in getting into the cafeteria and there were a few customers in there. She came to our table. We knew who she was, but she did not recognize us. She said, I've been watching you people. 
I'd be interesting to know who you are. I am Alice Robertson. We made her acquaintance. She was delightfully surprised that we were both employed at New Yorker boarding school. She proceeded to tell us all about her experience there as a young girl and her father's superintendent at the school. We were close friends with Alice Robertson after that. Our experience from New Yorker boarding school was resulted in my meeting a primary teacher from McAllister, Oklahoma, a Choctaw teacher, the daughter of Greenwood Lafour, whose grandfather was the last chief of the Choctaws east of the Mississippi River and whose signature was on the Dancing Rabbit Treaty, a treaty between the Choctaw Nation and the United States government. This treaty was a plan for changing the tribe to the Indian Territory. This young lady went back to her home in McAllister and was employed in the school in Pittsburgh County, but returned to New Yorker in 1915. In 1916, we both resigned, she as primary teacher and I as principal teacher. We took up residence after marriage at McAllister in Muskogee. My problem was to find a job. Fortunately, there was a vacancy as property clerk. Mr. Parker learned that I was there and would probably be interested in the position. He called me over. I was interviewed by his assistant and went to work in the Muskogee office and worked there from uh, July 1916 to September 1918. I missed World War One by one day. You realize that the war ended November the 11th. I was on a list for call November the 10th. My term as superintendent and Mrs. Brown's term as clerk at New Yorker boarding school was uh, ended July 1, 1920. The school was discontinued on that date no appropriation was made by the United States Congress for it. We were immediately transferred to Uche Boarding School, a co-educational co school at uh, Sapapa, Oklahoma. Mrs. Brown was clerk and I was superintendent there. We had had experience with the uh, Uche Boarding School in extracurricular activity. Their superintendent was a Missouri man, 
who had played on the University of Missouri team. And uh, after securing position as superintendent of Utah Boarding School, he uh, naturally was very interested in football. He coached the team. His uh, team, which uh, was drawn from an enrollment of 135 boys and girls, not including girls on the team, he uh, had an outstanding Indian boarding school football team. They practice with Sapapa boarding, Sapapa public school, a uh, high school, which had obtained championship in their district there and in the state. And because of that fact, they had to pay, play the champion high school team of, tele of uh, Texas, a high school located at Waxahachie, Texas. The Sapapa High School defeated that Texas team, and uh, Uche Boarding School always contributed their uh, victory to the fact that they were thoroughly trained and scrimmaged by the Indian football team. During the first year of our experience at Uchi Boarding School, the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs at Washington concluded that uh, it was necessary to cooperate with the administration to save fund and to combine some of the schools as New Yorker was combined with the uh, Eufaula Boarding School when the girls at New Yorker were transferred to Eufaula Boarding School. In the same manner, the girls at Uche Boarding School were transferred to Eufaula Boarding School, making Uche Boarding School a male school entirely. When I uh, was transferred from Uche Boarding School to Sequoia to Cherokee Orphan Asylum at Telegram, later changed to Cherokee Training School, and because of the type of name, the appropriation was changed to Sequoia Vocational School, giving us the name of a well-behaved group of teachers and students. I served at Sequoia Vocational School, now Sequoia High School, where two years ago approximately one million and a half dollars were spent for new buildings. Several of the old buildings were torn down and replaced with modern buildings, modern heating equipment, modern lighting with natural gas. And now when I go to visit this school, 
I sometimes have to have somebody to conduct me around. The original building, the old Turkey Insane Asylum, was raised as was several other buildings not so suitable to modern school work. Sequoia High School now is making the, a name from their, for themselves. They have more money than uh, was ever appropriated for the school while I was there, which is very greatly appreciated because it gives an opportunity to young Indians who deserve the best in the education. They are obtaining that experience at this time. During my experience with government Indian boarding schools, I served in five Indian boarding schools as a student and as a teacher employee. That's about running me down. <laughs> Are you tired, it's Mr. Man? During my superintendency at Sequoia Vocational School, I attended the already organized Cherokee Male and Female Seminary Association, which is now closely associated with Northeastern State Teachers College and by their bylaws, a graduate of uh, the Cherokee Male Seminary can easily become a member of their association, a graduate organization. I have attended every homecoming since about 1932, uh, somewhere along there. I was the president of the association at one time. I took the place voluntarily of uh, Mrs. Lola Garrett Bowers, who was retiring from this school and have continued with it uh, uh, ever since as diligently as I can. I'd like to go to the restaurant. During my activity as uh, executive vice president of the Cherokee male and female seminaries, I have uh, enjoyed the experience very much, which generally consists first in a planning meeting after authorization by the president of the college. Along in the spring, about last of March or the first of April, earlier if we could have it, then the homecoming, which is always a great experience to the former students. And I would like to say that as much as our tribe contributed to the education of their boys and girls, we are coming to appreciate the fact that Northeastern State College is assuming the responsibilities that our nation loves so well 
and uh, we appreciate their concern for our association and the facilities that they furnish for our May the 7th homecoming date. We are always concerned that we'll be a burden to the college because our few in number. But any time you talk to our former students about the association, they declare that they will always support you to the end and college instructors and even the president through others have assured us that as long as they can cooperate with as long as we can cooperate with them we can feel sure that they are happy to work with us and that they appreciate the fact that uh, our group had been interested in the old institution which is now Northeastern State College. I thank you for this opportunity. <laughs>